Uh, my name is Vashek, for those who don't know me. And uh, we'll start right away. So uh, you should have this uh, website. I hope I can follow you the URL. And we will follow the instructions there. And we will start with introduction. So just go there. And first we have to start the grass. So for me it's like grass. And we follow you from to this point. And you will get this dialogue which requires you to understand how the grass uh, data are stored in the grass spatial database. And this is what is explained here in the tutorial. So it basically requires you to fill out uh, these three items, uh, GRASS.js database directory, uh, GRASS location, and GRASS map set. And this is uh, uh, how the organization of the spatial database looks like. So just very quickly, uh, the GRASS database, usually it's called GRASS data. Uh, it would be a directory on your disk. And then it would have subdirectories. And these are called locations in GRASS, and each location has specific projection. So for example, here you can see SPM, which is just like what the user would choose for North Carolina state plane meters. And then US alpers and latitude, longitude. So this would be, this is one level, and we just downloaded a file. Uh, which was sample data for North Carolina, and that's a location, so that's on this level. And then uh, one level lower, which is what you have also select there is the map set. Uh, that's something like a namespace, where uh, that just serves you to organize your maps in some way. So you have your special data, and uh, if they are like all by one topic or one project or maybe some some area like Wake County, you would put it uh, to one map set. There is one special map set called permanent. Uh, that's just a, a name chosen for data which kind of stays uh, stay there permanently. You don't change them. You at the beginning of your project, you probably import them and then you have the data there and you don't edit them anymore. This would be like county boundaries or streams, depending on what your project is about. And then there are, of course, data, and we will work with that later. So now we have uh, this dialog here. And um, so if you don't have the right grass database, directory just browse for it. Uh, Windows users usually put it to documents. Uh, on Linux and Mac you usually put it just to your home directory. And usually you call it grass data. And you can have multiple of these on your disk if you want. And once you select it you will get selection of different locations which are there. I have there just one. Uh, so this, this is the NTSPM 08 graph 7. And, uh, and then uh, there are different map sets. Uh, no, of course, I was here for the grass GIS. Yeah. Just make sure I want to form. form. Yes, there are the right spot. Okay. And I can help you with like, getting started. You, or if you want to work on your laptop. I haven't done it installed. I'm just going to come see if I can install it. Okay. Yeah. So then we are starting a map set. Uh, and you should have their permanent map set. That's where like, most of the data are. And there is land set map set. We won't use that. That's like all the day, all different uh, land set scenes. Uh, just some sample, and then uh, we will create a new map set and let's call it intro. If we would be working on a uh, like a machine, which would be something like a 
a Linux server, then the map sets could be uh, like a workspaces for individual users. So I could have their workspace Vashek and somebody else would have some other uh, map set there. So I just clicked new and created the map set intro and then uh, can start. So you should, should get these two windows. Uh, this one is called Player Manager. So if I say Player Manager, I mean this one. And this one is Map Display, which is where the map will be. So, I'm, so I will be just following uh, this guide. So the next step is adding a raster map to the map display. So let's try that. So you can either go to File, Map Display, Add Raster, or what I usually do is in the toolbar there is Add Raster Layer, and then if you click here, then you can select from the different rasters, and these are the data which are already in the database. We will import something uh, later on. You can select elevation, or actually, the, let's follow the instructions which say LF underscore weight, something, something. But it doesn't matter. Uh, one of those elevation maps, that's what we need. And uh, let's uh, add a legend for it. So let's. Uh, Usually the map related things are handled in the map display. So there's another toolbar and there is add map elements. So we can add legend. And I never like this font here, so you don't have to follow this, but map display. So did you get to do have the legend and the map? There is not child at the top. No Not responding is, is happening for me too. Yeah, when I tested it, it they took some time and then it popped up. Uh, but I forgot about it. Ah. OK. Here, Arial is the simple choice, I guess. Okay, here it's Rowie and myself. And this will now be remembered all over, so maybe you want to do that. This was this uh, yellow field button. So now, uh, before we will go to the actual processing, uh, just let me talk about how the functionality in GRASS is uh, organized. It's organized into uh, functions or tools which are referred to as modules. And these modules, they have different uh, name, or there's a naming convention. Uh, there are ones which start with G, and these are general ones. And then, um, then there are Start with R and V, that's for raster and vector, uh, and so on and so on. There is imaginary 3D raster processing and temporal processing and several others. And there is uh, more uh, to it. For example, we will work with modules which starts which start with V dot net and then something that's for network analysis. So there is like one more level of this naming convention. This just helps you orient if you like already know the name of the module. But if you don't know the name of the module, how do you find that? 
So if I am back here in the layer manager, you can go here in the bottom to the search modules tab. And there is this uh, tree of modules which you can browse and find the module. Or if you are, if you know like which term you are searching for, you can just go to the search box and for example type slow. Okay. How did you get to that window? Uh, that's uh, in the layer manager at the bottom. Here are different tabs. Okay. So the first one is the map layers. That's what is active by default. So when you type it and press enter, it will give you the first match. If you keep pressing enter, it will give you the next matches. And our slope aspect, that's what we will use later. So let's just keep it here. Uh, there, are, there are different ways how you can, can get to the modules. You can browse through the main menu. Uh, that's basically the same three of modules, but just represented differently, if you prefer that. And here, actually, it shows the name of the module in the square brackets. So it's called here slope and aspect, but the actual module is r.slope.aspect. And if you would already know the name of the module, uh, you can use the command console tab, again at the bottom, and you can just type it. So if I already know the name r.slope.aspect, I can just type r.slope, and it actually suggests me some names. So slope aspect is already there. So I can just press enter. And if you press enter again, it will give you the graphical user interface for the module. Uh, and there is this uh, duality in GraphJS between uh, between the graphical user interface and the command line, uh, which we will use later on. So this is a window of uh, R.neighbors module for neighborhoods analysis on a raster. It's R. Uh, and you can see that there are uh, the different inputs, uh, like name of the input map and output. And at the bottom, you can't really see that here. But at the bottom, there is uh, actually a command which will be executed in the background. And if you already know the command, uh, you can just use the command line use for running the whole command. Um, these commands are very often in the user manual or in the instructions. We will have some of them in the workshop as well. Um, so if you, if you know it, you can either run it right away or you can do uh, the opposite thing than, uh, that it is done here. Here you would fill out the dialog and then the command would appear here, but you can do the same thing uh, in a reverse. You can read a command and see, well, input is here in the command. So then what you need is to find an input box, which is called input, and then you type the value there. But uh, before we actually do run the R slope aspect. Uh, the important part for raster processing is uh, in which extent you are doing the raster processing and which resolution you are using. And in GRASS, this is handled by computational region. So before the raster calculations, we have to uh, set the computational region. How we can do it, uh, there is several ways. Uh, and if the simplest one and the basic one is that you just want the computational region to match your input data. So in the layer manager, uh, back in the map layers, you can select the, uh, the elevation layer. And if you right click, there is set computational region from selected maps or map. 
And if you click that, it will uh, set the computational region x10 and the resolution to match this raster map. If you want to see the computational region, like which resolution is there, then you can type and we can just copy it from here. There is gf.region uh, minus p. That's a command to print the computational region. So we could also find it somewhere in the menu, but if we have the command, we can just type it and uh, it is executed. And here we can see, for example, that the resolution is one, and we are in North Carolina State Plain meters location, so the units are meters. And you can also see here in this output window, not only the output of the module, but also in gray, there is the command we just executed, G region minus P, but also there is a G region raster equals elevation that was the right click in the menu or in the GUI we did was actually this command in the background. So I already have this uh, r.slope.aspect uh, GUI here. So I will just use it. Uh, so inputs. And for the outputs, I will just type slope for slope and aspect for aspect. The different parameters are uh, uh, organized in these groups or tabs. So you uh, can quickly browse through them and select only what you need. And when you hit run, it again gives you the actual command it was using. And it also automatically added a result to the map display. So this is the aspect, this is the slope. And when we zoom out, you can, for example, see that the size actually matches the elevation map we used. So did you get there? Are you satisfied? So that's all from Inter, actually. And if you go back to the main page of the tutorial, uh, there are different options. So you can go through them at home. Most of them are done in the way that you can do it alone. Um, but uh, I decided, actually, because you were coming, uh, that we will do network analysis using four interfaces. So this will be vector analysis uh, using, uh, using network analysis. And we will do it in four different ways if we will make it. Uh, so you can see, actually, the different approaches to uh, using grass GIS. And then you can just generalize for all the other tools. So what we will need is a vector map. We don't need those. So we can just select them and remove them. This just removes them from the list of layers. The data are still in the data. We also don't need a legend, so we can put a legend. With the right click. And then here in the uh, menu, there is this uh, B shaped symbol, which is for adding vectors. And we will use a vector called uh, streets bank. So that these are streets for bank accounts. And then in the map display, there is uh, a button in the second part of the toolbar, let's say. It just analyze map. And if you click that, you will get a submenu. And in there, there is 
uh, at the bottom very a vector network analysis tool, which takes some time to load, and then uh, from the point of view of the of using RASGES, this is like a specialized interface. Before we were using, um, it doesn't look uh, the same as the one for our neighbors and our slope aspect. It's specialized, just focused on the uh, network analysis. So we will do shortest path because it's just simple, uh, and it's done actually by the v.net.path. Uh, module, we will use the streets wake uh, vector map, and then we have to select the two points in between we want the shortest path computed. So here at the bottom, there are these different tabs. So the first one is points. So if you click on a point and then click on this uh, arrow symbol, which says insert, po insert points uh, from a map display. So if you click that, you can then go to map display and select a place somewhere. And then the second place. And it will. There are even the things like turns, like you can't do the left turn right there. I don't really understand it that much, but uh, I know it. So if uh, so, this is just a picture. If you want the actual data, uh, what you do is uh, here in the top there is same temporary result, which is maybe not the correct name, uh, and you just type a, a name of the output. So for example, path. And now I actually got uh, another layer here, uh, and. There's actual data which not which I have now in the grass database, and I would be able to do things like export it to a shape file. Want to do that? So actually, based on his question, if you on the on the uh, main page on the like when you go back to points, mm -hmm. at the bottom there is a uh, cost function that basically you can do use the cost from the uh, the terrain, or from node to node, and that kind of stuff. So there, there is some functionality yeah. there. Yeah, for the cost. Yeah, I from elevation to elevation. So if you do the drop down for the first cost uh, drop down, oh, yeah. that one. Yeah. Yeah. Move a little more. Okay. So you're gonna select cost for nodes and for lines, and uh, there is actually several. The things are managed or are in the attribute table for the vectors. And there is probably several the v.net modules which will help you manage the tables in the way which is like acceptable for all the other modules. Like for the turns, I think you have to like uh, create a special attribute table just for the turn information. Yeah, so this was uh, one kind of interface. Uh, it's very focused. It will like uh, allow you to like nicely switch in between the different uh, vector network analysis and so on. Uh, but this is just network analysis. So if you uh, if you want a more general interface, and if you are following the uh, file. Here with the instructions, we are in using a module directly through GUI. So you can do exactly that. You can uh, use the v.net.path module uh, directly, uh, or you can use the GUI, which is meant for uh, for this module, but automatically generate. And this is what we did for the uh, r.slope.aspect. So now, from the tool, we already know that we want uh, dot method of path. So I can just type it and start the dialog. 
And here I can fill the same, so streets A, and the output, so let's name it path 2. So cost we are skipping. And in optional, uh, it says uh, uh, name of file containing start and end points. Uh, so it's a little bit more difficult now because it wants a file with uh, the coordinates of the points. So uh, what is nice that actually it's, it is a text file and uh, you would be able to edit it in like a text editor like Notepad++. But what the graphical user interface does is that it gives you this big box which is labeled enter values directly and you can edit this text file right away and in the background it's creating a temporary file and taking care of it. So you would be entering the, the latitude and longitude there? Yeah. Well, uh, it's actually projected so what the coordinates are they of those? I see. Uh, so if you go to the map display and do right click, there is copy coordinates to clipboard, and that's very handy for all the other cases as well. So you can do it and paste it here, and then you can do other the other point. Uh, but what, uh, what we should check is what's the format of the file, and it's actually not this. Uh, and if you go to the manual tab at the, at the top, uh, you get to the manual of the, of the module, you can get this uh, manuals online as well. Uh, with this one, you are guaranteed that that's actually the version you are using. So it has all the updates, but it doesn't have anything additional. And if, well, I already looked at the menu, so somewhere in the middle, uh, there is some, there is syntax for the for the file, and actually it's. Uh, it says that we should put one pair of the uh, one pair of the points per line. So, and it, there should be some ID at the beginning, which will go to the uh, resulting vector map. So, uh, the first is ID, and then uh, coordinates of the first point, the second point, that everything is separated by spaces. So. I'll do that. So ID, I choose one, space, coordinate of the first point. Then we copy them with uh, comma, so I will replace the comma by space. Then I don't need a new line, but I need space. And then I get the comma, uh, I'll change it to space. This is actually a little bit more difficult than like the average module. Usually you don't have to deal with uh, a file like this. But on the other hand, some modules will allow you to do some more fancy things if you do something like this. So it's quite handy to know, know this. Um, so these are the coordinates, and that's uh, all we were filling before. So let's just run it. So here it did very much the same as before. And I didn't get any results, so, oh, I did, okay. It just has wrong color. So, if you double click on the, on the layer in the layer manager, uh, you get this uh, dialog, which actually looks the same as, as all the other dialogs, but this one is for displaying maps or handling the symbology. Uh, so we can go to colors, change to red, let's say. I press apply. Look at this thing. So in line, we can change fit and color. So 
Did you get it here? Or did you get out the first time? I don't hear real well. Sorry. I'm just asking if you want to say something. No, it kind of looks like my commute. <laughs> Uh, this doesn't take the traffic into account, right? Uh, okay, so this was the second way. Uh, and now the command line way. Actually, I still have here the v.method path uh, uh, dialog, so the the command is here. I could probably also copy it here, the copy button. You would get the command, which you can use later on. Or here, uh, in the instructions, uh, the command is actually there, v.net of path. And what we could do, we can probably do it, is to create a File manually. I'm not sure. Should we try? It's basically the same as it before. So let's try it so you believe me. <laughs> so let's try not that plus plus. So not that plus plus. And uh, I already prepared the coordinates, or you can copy them from the on display as well. So I'll just copy it down from here. Save the file somewhere. I don't have here any directory, so specify the full path to the file, and since I don't know how to do this effectively on Windows, I will do something else, which might be useful for you as well. Um, so in settings, grass working environment, uh, there is there. change working directory. Uh, so we are connected to a database, but of course the directory on disk where the processes are running, that is something different. Uh, so, if I do that, I put it somewhere in my documents. Intro. So now what we basically did uh, was that we did a CD command in the background. But it's, it actually ap applies to this graphical, graphical user interface. So now I can use this command and I can copy it here. Or actually, I don't have to copy it because uh, then I can show you uh, that for the existing uh, things uh, like vector and raster maps in the database. If you type the name and equals, it will offer you the selection of the existing maps. So I put three. So it autocompletes these grass related things. So that's the advantage of this command line. On Linux, I'm actually using the Linux command line because it has different features. But the output, I, I just need to, uh, output I uh, will create a new one. So, uh, three. And then the last parameter is file. 
passed to the file, and I will just use the one I created and I named it fast.txt, and I'm in the directory where the file is, so I don't have to specify the full file. Again, I have to change the colors. Oh. If you would be on uh, Linux, uh, in the Linux command line, you would be also able to use this special syntax I'm not sure if some of you have seen something like this. Uh, you can put the file directly into the command line, like the content of the file. And then the v.net or path module will actually read it from standard input, which is a uh, command line thing. Where the module doesn't read something, read something like a file, but the file like, doesn't exist and the standard input is provided in some other way. So in this case, it's actually provided right away in the command line. So two tricks, I guess. Well, and the fourth way uh, of accessing the grass modules uh, is uh, from Python. So for it, we can use uh, uh, the Python shell tab, again, here in the layer manager at the bottom. There is Python shell, and you can do things like add two numbers together and so on in that. And it's, of course, from Python, so uh, you can do all the other things as well. And in our case, uh, just put it on the side here. We will use the use the v.net.path module. But for that, we need to first import the grass packages. So the grass package you will need is called uh, grass.script. And we can, we can shorten the name to GS. That's uh, just how the things in Python work. I'm not sure if you know Python, right? But you know, you know Python. Just watch it. Uh, so this is just how you get the functionality there. So if you copy and paste it and press enter, it will execute. Then for the inputs, I just prepare there the variables because that's how you would usually do it in the script. So let's just copy those. So I there the name of the uh, input uh, vector. Uh, network, then the name of the output, and then the, the two points, I have them there as a string, but in the formatting which is required for the file. So this is still the same. And then the function we will need uh, is write command. And actually, what is nice is that all of this was uh, of Python, and on the other hand, if you already know Grass, then now the rest is basically what you need, what you already know from Grass, because you are using the v.net.path module, so we just specify the name of the module. Uh, it's a, it is as a string in Python, um, just how it is. And then the parameters are keyboard arguments of the Python function. So uh, we just specify all of them, but they are separated by commas. And of course, in this case, we are using the variables which are strings or numbers or whatever is appropriate. While in the command line, you right away put there the, the values. Right? When I installed Grass an hour ago, did I also just install another Python.exe? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
this would this doesn't happen on Linux, where the, all the programs are managed by the distribution, the people who are preparing your Linux distribution. So there, they would they actually take care of like that. All the programs are using the same software or same dependencies, but on Linux, uh, on Windows, there is no way how to reasonably do it. So that's why you have so many Pythons on your computer. Uh, and that the say make is somewhere in between, depending on what you are using for installing stuff. Um, yeah, so this function, um, we are there is actually one maybe more basic version of this function, but we want to actually uh, provide this uh, input, this file, and in this we could create a file and then specify the file parameter as we did uh, before in the command line. But uh, this write command function actually uses this standard input I was talking about. So if you specify this std in parameter, which is the usual shortcut for uh, uh, standard input, uh, you can put there just a string and the function will take care of all these uh, Standard input magics in, uh, behind the scenes. So now I can just put that. And in this case, I have to add the uh, vector manually, but it's here for this part. That's the name I enter there. Again, I guess I have to change the colors. Oh, okay. It's actually the same one as before. Because I'm using the coordinates from the from the exercise. Yeah, so uh, just to sum up the interfaces, so the first one was very specialized, but still in the background there was the, the module, but uh, you were using like this high level, very convenient interface, uh, but not always it is available, not always it is actually needed. So for that, uh, there are these standardized dialogues, which has some features like selecting a map, but otherwise they are very general. And then if you already know the command, then you can use the command line. And the commands are actually the way how to store your workflow. So I can go to the command console and copy, uh, copy this command and just put it to some text file. And the text file will be my workflow. And the next time I can just go through the text file and I have all my uh, work there, and of course it's a text, so you can put it to your report, to uh, the appendix, uh, paper, or whatever is appropriate. And when you are, uh, when you want to do some more serious scripting, then of course Python is the way. So then this command can be very easily transferred to Python syntax, and then. You just combine it with some other Python. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, um, questions? There is uh, one more interface I was talking about, and that's. Uh, Graphical modeler. I don't use it, so I don't know uh, that much about it. But uh, it does what uh, you would expect it to do. Uh, it creates these bubbles and squares 
and you do kind of graphical programming to create your workflow. And there is a save button to save it as a Python script or kind of a Python script template. So you can do that. How did you get this? So it's in the layer manager. Uh, in the toolbar, there is a graphical modeler the thing with all the arrows and bubbles. Getting the graphs manual that might be uh, quite useful. So you can just uh, uh, Google for the right version or something like this, but then it is the help button uh, which will get you to the online version of graphs manual. Oh, uh, that's, uh, no, it will use your browser, but it will use the local copy of the graphs manual. So uh, it is what you can use it offline. And uh, if you want to find some functionality, uh, what you can do here, the, you can like go through these different selections there, but you can also do, and I do this often, so there's at the bottom there is full index link, and it will get you to this uh, long list of graph modules. So, you can search in it in the same way as well with Control F and your browser search, like so. So we're searching for before. So how did you open this video uh, the, the, from the, the the layer manager? Yeah, from the layer manager there is this. That's uh, manual. Okay, so if this ring, yeah, I see it more. And this is the same manual, uh, maybe a little bit different colors, as we are looking at uh, inside the graphical user interface in the manual tab. And it starts with a like, short description of the module, uh, then key bars, which you can actually uh, click on and get to some uh, related modules through there. So that's quite handy. And then uh, here comes the Quick uh, intro to the command line syntax if you like are already knowledgeable in that and you just need this for reference. And then there is the description of all the parameters. Uh, there are actually two different kinds of parameters. One of them are the ones like we are filling elevation, there is the name of the map. Then uh, there are also ones which are called flags. And uh, this just usually sets some special behavior. So in this case, it's some alignment of, of the raster cells. And there is one important thing we didn't hit at any point. Uh, if the data already exists, uh, the modules will refuse to overwrite them. And if you want to actually replace the old data by new data, you have to uh, use this uh, minus minus overwrite flag, which in GUI is a checkbox. You check and then it will overwrite. In ArcPy, you set a global parameter, overwrite is true. Is that what you do somehow in? You can do Grace? it. You can do it in some cases. It's appropriate. Uh, you shouldn't do it, probably, okay. in your. But because it, but uh, you can do it with uh, uh, grass underscore overwrite uh, envir environment variable. So it's like just system environment variable grass underscore overwrite all caps, and you set it to one number one. What's on the Windows machine? Uh, this works on any. Oh, in the game, like yeah. It's a, the so you you don't you don't do it in your environment. You will do it in Python, like with uh, OS dot environment. 
think it's the name of the yes. dictionary better. Makes our stuff. Yeah, and the manual continues with like hopefully some description and the examples. And the examples are usually written as commands. So if you see the commands in the well R so aspect, I can just fire up the GUI for R so aspect if I type it, and then you find uh, the parameter slope, elevation, and so on. You can fill it up. How I usually work is that when I don't know the module, I usually use the graphical user interface. Then I fill it out, and then once I have it, I copy it to the command line, and then usually you have to like change the resolution and change this parameter and so on if you are at several times. So that's the part I do in the command line, which is more effective for it. What you usually get with grass modules is at the, at the end there is a list of references to papers from which like the module was implemented. So if there are some more advanced concepts, uh, usually they'll have some papers link. Uh, which are either uh, either written by the actual authors of the module and they at the same time publish something. So that's usually more like the cutting edge things or at least cutting edge things at the time of creation of the module. Or it can be just the classic references uh, according to which you post. Uh, okay. So it seems like, you know, maybe you have some kind of deal from somebody who is on the one, but it was there at one point. And sometimes they don't know either. Yeah. So how do you deal with that kind of stuff in grass? Yeah. Uh, I actually forgot that I actually skipped that part of the import. But what you uh, what you can do is if the if the metadata are correct, uh, then there is a module for thrusters. It's called R import, and you fill the name of the file and the output and then some details like for raster's resolution and so on and or like you say it should get the resolution and so on and if the projection or the coordinate system information is correct it will import it into your coordinate system it's reading the, the header line of the okay. And most of the time in the background, GDAL or OGR will be used for that. So basically the question, if grass supports format XY, is question if GDAL supports format XY. So you can just uh, find that out. Of course, I'm not sure if this one Oh, this one actually doesn't do it. And there is another module which will list the uh, different uh, formats. If the projection is, the information is wrong, <coughs> then of course that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, what or you can do? Doesn't exist. Yeah. What you can, if if it doesn't exist, but it's the one which actually matches your location. Uh, for there is this.